Now let's talk about something completely different. Nearly 10,000 bodies are waiting to be identified each year in South Africa's medico-legal laboratories. And that's according to research conducted by Dr. Catherine Smith, who is now currently the head of visual arts department at Stellenbosch University. But Smith, in her PhD, focused on forensic visual identification processes. And she says, although forensic facilities photograph deceased people, her research shows that there's no image standardization, making the post-mortem photos unreliable. Let's find out more now from Dr. Catherine Smith herself, who joins us virtually from Cape Town. Catherine, thank you so much for your time this evening. The head of visual arts department in Stall at Stellenbosch University, most of us will have an idea of what that department looks like, what they do, what their students are like, and what the day-to-day -day is like in that department. But you chose to do a PhD focused on forensic visual identification processes, like we just said, basically working with cadavers as part of your research. Now, for us lay people, that seems like quite a leap, but I'm sure you're now going to tell us that it's not that much of a step. Connect the dots for me between those two worlds. Sure. Thank you for having me. Um, as a child, I was always interested in the way that art could be used for police investigations. And having had a tough choice between pursuing uh, forensic pathology after matriculating or visual art, I chose sure. visual art and have just found my way back into the forensic field. For me, it's a way of bridging my interests in art and science, but also social and criminal justice. It's absolutely fascinating that you were able to come basically full circle, but from two worlds that seem so far apart. Uh, now, now take us back to the base here. Explain to us what are the two basic forms that people use to identify bodies that could be part of the problem as to why we're sitting with so many corpses um, which are going unidentified. Right. So in forensic human identification, we have what we call primary methods of identification. These are the scientifically acceptable ones, the ones that the courts accept. So these are fingerprints, dental, and DNA. And then we have secondary methods of identification, which include contextual information, clothing and personal effects, tattoos, and facial depictions. So in the South African context, we have a very complex context. We have people moving around internally mm. in the country. We've got people coming into our country from outside of South Africa, potentially undocumented. And because of you know, radical social inequality in our country, a mm. lot of people don't have access to basic health care. So dental records are not necessarily always available. Sure. Fingerprints that are on record might not have correct names attached to them. And DNA is obviously a fantastic technology, but also expensive. And all of these primary methods um, are comparative, which means that you need to have a sample on file in order to compare mm. another sample with that. So with our complex context of identification, I saw some parallels with other contexts internationally, particularly where we have a lot of migrants dying in boats sinking in the Mediterranean or attempting to cross the desert borderlands between uh, Mexico and the United States, for example. And in those other complex contexts, they're looking at the kinds of techniques you would use in a disaster identification scenario where it's really important to have reliable anti-mortem information and post-mortem information. So my thinking is that in our context, we need to apply these methods and really look at the value of the secondary identifiers to assist in the crisis that we're facing. Now talk to me about where your forensic visual identification process is, the field that you study comes in, because I believe there's only one other person who is a specialist in this field, and that's an academic in Scotland. How is this changing the game and all of these issues that you've just mentioned? Yeah, so the person you mentioned is probably my ex-supervisor and colleague, Professor Caroline Wilkinson. There are many qualified forensic artists around the world and Professor Wilkinson started a program in Dundee, which continues to run. She later uh, moved to Liverpool, which is where I did my PhD with her at Liverpool John Moores University. In the South African context, within the South African police services, we have two extremely qualified, extremely experienced forensic artists that focus on the post-mortem work. There's another aspect to forensic art, which is identification and depiction of the living. So that's interviewing witnesses or victims of crime to develop a composite of um, a person of interest. 
So, and then I have my colleague and PhD student, Pearl Mamatuba, who is the only other civilian qualified, mm. formally qualified, academically qualified forensic artist um, working outside of, of SAPS. So, and it's valuable to us to be able to do this work in a research context because we can conduct research, conduct and design research projects that can assist in validating and, um, you know, confirming what other methods could possibly be used to assist. Now, now give us a case study. In, a, in an article uh, a, a, that you spoke to, to News24, you speak about one specific case where a body had been retained for 687 days, and you believe mm. that the identification process you went through to finally identify that person really encompassed what you would, this kind of technology would be able, be able to do. Talk us through that case, if you can, in, uh, in a short way. So that case was one of the samples that I tracked through through my research process. That individual was sadly not identified, but the 687 days is significant because mm -hmm. in our country, our, for it, our forensic services can legally release a body for burial after 30 days. And what we're realizing is the complexity of our context means that 30 days is definitely not enough time. So for me, the significance of that 687 day retention is the absolute dedication of that particular facility to attempt to identify this individual by any means necessary. Um, but sadly, that did not happen, and they were released for burial. Now, you do talk about this being a, a silent disaster. I believe the, the quote was that we're sitting within so many of our provinces, and you talk about yourself and, and another civilian uh, academic being the only civilians qualified in this way. How do you take your expertise forward so that we can see a decrease in these really, really tragic numbers of bodies of human beings with stories that are, are being left unidentified and families out there uh, left with so many unanswered questions? How can we take this uh, really particular set of expertise that you and your colleague now have and, and try and make a difference here? Well, that's really the critical point. So awareness like this, thank you for giving the platform because this is a silent mass disaster in the sense that it's not a not a reality that many people are aware of or could possibly be because mm. these, you know, not everyone has access to the realities of the day to day, you know, of a forensic pathology services facility. The other issue is training after awareness and we are assisting in training forensic officers in fingerprinting in standardized post-mortem facial photography techniques. Um, I train uh, forensic dentistry students at the University of the Western Cape. I'm introducing some of these ideas into my teaching in the hope that it will encourage people to want to consider pursuing this extremely niche um, mm -hmm. and scarce skill, but clearly a skill that we need more of. And I also think that we should open up the opportunity of the hive mind of social media to assist because you only commission a facial image uh, with the view to publicly circulate it because you mm. want eyes on the problem so that this person can be identified. A lot of these images are being produced, but sadly they don't reach circulation. So we're also not familiar with what a post-mortem depiction or a facial reconstruction necessarily looks like in our context. And we have seen that when cases do make it to social media, the chances of someone recognizing that person is just that much greater because you've got more eyes on the case rather than a single image pinned up on a notice board, you know, at a shopping center or in a police charge office. Um, quite a few stories in the news of late that really uh, proves that point, I think, over and over again. Thank you so much. Dr. Catherine Smith, head of the Visual Arts Department at Stellenbosch University, but um, uh, talking to us there about her PhD research, which focused on forensic visual identification processes. Fascinating, fascinating work that she uh, and her colleague is doing. We thank her so much for her time this evening.